Good morning. Welcome to Heart of Worship service this morning. We're so glad to be here with you worshiping today. Lamentations chapter 3, starting with verse 22, says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Will you please stand if you're physically able? The words will be on the screen. Let us worship. I am surrounded on every side. Can't see the light of day. But I am persuaded beyond all hope. You won't. Take my claim on every word you say. You will not be late. I will see.
Thank you, praise band, and good morning all. I hope as you are feeling welcomed and warned by the Spirit here that you'll take a moment and extend that welcome to your friends and neighbors in the pews around you. As you are getting comfortable back in your seats, I hope you'll take a moment and pick up the Ritual of Friendship pad located on one of the ends of the pew and add your name and a welcome for our friends who will be here at the 11 o'clock service. I do have a few announcements and thank yous to extend this morning as we extend thanks to um, one of our new praise band substitutes over there in the corner. Do you see him over there? It looks a little bit different than Sean, but that is still David, and he's just as talented, and we are grateful for his help this morning. So you're welcome. Uh, Sean and Emily, who's also missing from over there in our corner, they are with our young adults, or excuse me, our youth in Montreat this week. So please keep them in prayers as they are the adult leadership for a wonderful week of faith, growth, and love as they experience worship with other youth, sing some beautiful songs together, and really grow in their faith as in small groups. So continue to keep them in their, your prayers and really hold in prayer Emily as she does not get to come home at the end of the week. She goes straight into middle school youth conference, greatest scrape on that Saturday. So she is jumping from one ship to another and cruising on through the week next week too. So continue to hold her in prayers as well. This morning, I'd also like to extend thanks to our team who put together an amazing Saturday soup kitchen yesterday and served, I got the report, they served 85 through their first time through and serving over 135 in total. And they had some subs, baked beans, and coleslaw. So we extend our thanks to Denise Cole, Kim Zimmerman, uh, Roseanne, Roseanne Gorski, She's out there too. We have a few from both groups. Um, Andy Vogue, 
the Knapp family, the Martin family, and of course the Henrys. So we extend their thanks to their leading and filling in for this last night. And if this is something that got you itching, we do have dates open in August. So please check the sheets downstairs or call the church office and they can give you what dates are available. It is a great way to serve our community and it clearly is filling a need this summer. So we extend thanks to them. And finally, we would like to begin in helping support that ministry. This Sunday is the third Sunday and our three cents a meal offering is this morning. So I hope you have got your pennies and your coins ready. And I'd like to invite my three penny partners. I see a few in the back corners. You saved the day. Otherwise we're asking some young at hearts to help us. So if they wouldn't mind coming up and grabbing a basket and we are gonna share our three penny partner offering this morning before we continue with worship. We are grateful for these gifts of generosity and let us continue in that worship by offering it up another song in worship.
Amen. I would like to invite our youngest disciples to join me down front for our time with them. And of course, I want sharing a delightful book with you all. I did the huge chair this morning. Oh. Good morning. Got a few more friends coming. All right, all of you are getting situated and seated. You get to see the beautiful cover of our book this morning. It is called Swashby and the Sea. And it is by Beth Ferry and it's illustrated by Joanna Martinez Neal. And I thought this book was delightful. I wanted to share it with you all. So let's join Shosh Swashby by the Sea. And it begins Captain Swashby loved the sea. The sea and he had been friends for a long, long time. She knew him in and out, up and down, better than anyone. So, when Swashby retired, it was to a small house on a small beach as close to the sea as he could be. Whenever he needed something, the sea provided exactly the right thing at exactly the right time. Life was just the way Swashby liked it. Salty and sandy and serene. Until... Squeaks and squeals from the empty house next door, which was no longer empty. It had been com commandeered by a girl and her granny, who planted umbrellas, scattered beach chairs, and, oh, boarded Swashby's deck without permission. Swashby battened down the hatches, hid when the doorbell rang, and fed their oatmeal cookies to the gulls. He didn't need neighbors. He didn't want neighbors. Neighbors were noisy and a nuisance annoying. So, in return, he left a message written to clearly in the sand. You read it, it says, no trespassing. Which the sea fiddled with just a bit. Sing. Sing, the little girl read and did just that. She sang every song that she knew while dancing up and down Swashby's deck. What now, she asked. Now vanish, Swashby wrote later that evening, adding a starfish exclamation point. And the sea fiddled. Just a bit. Wish, the little girl read, picking up the starfish, and she did just that. She closed her eyes and began, I wish. No, 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 Swashby interrupted, stomping down the steps. If you mean, to make a starfish wish, you must say this. Starfish back to the waves so blue, the sea will see a wish come true. How lovely, said Granny. We wish you'd come for a cup of tea, Mr. Swashby. But Swashby 
wished to be left alone. So he grumbled and mumbled and hurried inside. He didn't need tea. He didn't want tea. Tea was civilized, friendly, neighborly. Go ahead, crossing his arms, he doesn't want tea. What he needed was a new message. Please go away, he wrote firmly in the sand. And once again, the sea fiddled just a little bit. Play, the little girl sounded out, and she did just that. With swaspy shells and stones, with his buckets and shovels. But her towers kept falling. Barnacle bottoms, Washby muttered, marching out. You doing it all wrong. You must not use the sun-baked sand. It's the sea sand down the tr does the trick. And he showed her how to dig for the wet sand below. Then, but Schwashby was gone. Before long, amazing sculptures decorated the beach. It's the clamshells you should be using, Schwashby called from inside. Come play, Mr. Schwashby, the little girl called back. Schwashby doesn't play, he answered, banging the shutters. So the sea decided to meddle more than just a little. She inched her way up the sand and tickled the little girl's toes. She nibbled on the sculptures and slurped away the buckets. And slurped away the buckets. The little girl tried to grab it, but look at me, she, the little girl called. Look at her, Granny gasped. Oh dear, look at her. Granny hurried to the water's edge, but Schwashby was already there. What are you up to, you salty imp, he asked, scooping the little girl and the bucket with a great big wave. The sea delivered the pair back to the shore. And there was no stomping, the, there was no stopping the laughing and thanking and hugging that was Schwashby's reward. I see what you did, he whispered to the sea as he was whisked away to the celebrate. After that, it was easy for Swashby to have tea with the girl and her granny, and ice cream, and lobster, and s'mores on the beach. It was easy for him to share his special sea glass. It was even easy for him to see that neighbors could be fun too, and friends, and family. And when he had a moment to himself, Swashby carved a heartfelt message to the sea. Thank you, friend. Which the sea fiddled with just a little bit. The end. What a wonderful story about friendship, huh? Lots of fun by the sea, something you guys, are, I'm sure, do very often. I hope you enjoyed this story and see how it connects for all of us as God's disciples this morning in the story. So let's close our time together in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for friendships and those moments when we are shown love in tea and cakes and gathering at the sea. We continue to ask that you will provide us opportunities to be those friends 
and invite others to play with us. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. The psalmist asks a question. How long? How long will we live unjustly and show partiality instead of loving as God has loved us? Trusting in that love, let us now confess our transgressions to the Lord. Will you please join me in our prayer of confession? Merciful God, we confess that we have been distracted with many things and have not loved you with our whole heart and strength. We have not paid attention to your word. We have allowed the poor to be neglected and the weak to be oppressed. We have been impatient in worship and insincere in our dealing with others. Forgive us, we pray, and teach us repentance. Free us from our habits of pride and make us steadfast in faith that we may live as those who are reconciled with you in Jesus Christ, our Lord, with whom we pray. We lift all these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ is merciful to all who turn to him in repentance. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning comes from the book of Genesis, right there at the beginning. Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 15. Listen now to God's word to us this morning. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of the Marmee as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, If I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quick, quickly three measures of choice flour knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant, who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Sarah and Abraham were old, advanced in age, and it had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? And say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. But he said, Oh, yes. You did laugh. The word of the Lord. Ah, this familiar story 
one I distinctly remember from my very first preaching class in seminary. This is a text I took as a scripture for one of my very first sermons. I remember this time of anxiety in preparing that very first sermon, of painstaking research and reading, exploring commentaries and resources about Genesis and this Abrahamic covenant, and reading about so many things. And I remember being so excited to share what I thought was a very unique hook. My way of connecting that Old Testament story to today. And so I also remember standing in that basement, getting ready to share that very first sermon as I filled with the sleeves of my sweater, my hair, my papers. I was nervous. And guess what? I found it. There's a copy of it, a VHS. So are you ready to hear it? All right, just kidding. <laughs> I'm not going to share that with you this morning. Um, but I did take a few screenshots on my phone later if you'd want to see what little baby Sarah looked like in that second year of seminary, just, I believe, maybe 22, 23 years old. <laughs> you see, that memory is so strong, not because this first sermon was so amazing. It shot it out of the park. I did great, naturally, obviously. No. The te this text and the memories around it in that first sermon come to mind because of how my preacher instructor was so critical when I came to that part about what I thought was the centrality, the hook of this story. Uh, how I really focused on how Sarah named Isaacs and the importance for us of naming how we use naming to denote a history, this presence, but also connecting back to the past and our hope for the future and giving of a name. But see, I had missed the focus of this scripture in that time. Maybe that's why I needed a preaching class. <laughs> what I had missed on, what I had been so focused on was what the people were doing, that I missed the main character there sitting in the midst of the visitors of just what God exactly was up to with these two people in the desert. God fiddled right there in the center of the narrative as the visitor becomes one and questions them. The Lord hurls a question into the midst of the narrative which echoes throughout Genesis 18 and orients it as a whole. Is there anything too wonderful for the Lord? Here, here was the key of the narrative. It was about what God does and is capable of doing. That sticks with me. You see, there was this long saga happening in Genesis, beginning in chapter 12. I'm sure you have remember it, about how there was introduction to Abraham and Sarah through God's promise of a covenant. God promised these first peoples in chapter 12. The first Abrahamic covenant is announced where God speaks to Abraham saying, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The word of the Lord. And as yet, as they journeyed across nations, age in ways, of course, expected, as we get older, they prospered and they failed. And the covenant is announced again by God in chapter 13 and 15. As, Abra as God says again to Abraham, look towards the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. And so he said, God said to him, so shall your descendants be. 
And again, in chapter 17, Abraham is reminded that as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Yet, nothing. You see, prior to today's text, this Abrahamic promise of land, God's presence, and these people through Abraham had only been spoken to him as he too gets a name change. It is here in chapter 18, within these verses, we get just a small inkling of what Sarah thought of these crazy dreams, these grandiose promises that have yet to be realized. And her first response as Sarah listened from inside the tent is laughter. Some Bible translates it as we have here about how she laughed to herself. Other translations could be how she laughed from the very middle of her belly, and maybe even from her womb herself, all denoting this private moment of woman who, as one commentator notes, we have in this story a powerful example where humanity often finds itself when it sits in the presence of God. We are in a place of laughter, not the laughter of joy and happiness, but the laughter of disbelief and astonishment. Why did Sarah laugh? Because it is what we as humans do when faced with a possibility of more than what our limited minds can grasp. We often know no other way than those circumstances. We are incredulous in our laughter, unwilling or unable to accept the idea that God might actually accomplish what God promised. So how else in our life today do we respond to those dreamers, though, or even when those dreams themselves bubble up inside of us in our own lives? Is your first thought laughter? <laughs> no way, what are you thinking, God? Are you hearing and you met those people that sometimes share with us who seem to have those unending hopes and dreams, those dreams of and able to think of a new job, going back to school, learning how to do something new like painting or maybe even going into a dangerous adventure across the horizon? <laughs> we laugh. <laughs> we may even respond like Sarah hearing those big dreams especially when our reality feels more sometimes like a desert. That dry, scorching heat that seems to drain all life out of us. Or maybe even we're perfectly content to sit alone on the seaside. Did you notice the name of Swashby's boat in our children's story this morning? El Recluso. So we allow those day-to-day -day tasks to take over, the doctor's appointments, the grocery lists, the laundry, the bills, and our care for others that allow that dream to go deeper down, a pee that uncomfortably is between our cushions as we sit down at the end of the day. Or maybe we sit serene and isolated, perfectly content where we are, and then those unexpected visitors arrive. Because see, sometimes we seem to think that God is so big, so other, so uninterested in human affairs. Or maybe even we think God, we see God like other parts in scripture, as an author of a Jewish history summarizes it this way. Elsewhere in the Torah, God is shown to be wrathful and punishing, and human beings are shown to cringe and cower in fear of him. And for good reason, too. God is perfectly capable of scourging and even killing men and women who are not sufficiently compliant and deferential. But at this moment, during his tete-for-tete -tete with Sarah, all of our expectations about who God is 
and what God wants from us is tweaked. Sarah is so unafraid of the Almighty that she laughs at his words and then lies to his face. The all-knowing, all-seeing God of Israel is so taken aback that he's forced to ask why. Why is she laughing at his solemn promise? For all of her audacity and boldness, God responds only with a petulance rather than punishing wrath. And so it is symbolized how little God, Sarah fears God, as the child she bears in fulfillment of that promise is Yitzhak, Isaac. I laugh, a pun in Hebrew on the word for laughter. The very miracle announced in this passage speaks of God's mighty power to act in the midst of the most hopeless situations. A God who took Sarah's disbelief, doubt, lies, and even that physical reality of being a barren woman whose hope for a child was as dry as that desert they lived in to something amazing, something spoken to by God himself is anything too wonderful for God? Is anything too amazing for God, for the Lord? And that question lingers. The question dares to speak to life those unspoken dreams, those long buried hopes, those glimmers of God's kingdom just to the left of your eyesight. As we have been so focused and wrapped up in what humans are doing, not doing, should be doing, we miss the invitation in what God is already up to. We become Abraham, running around, doing and ordering and preparing that we miss the experience, the recognition of joining God's redemptive work in the world. So, this morning I invite you to pause and see what God is doing. Put on maybe a different set of glasses to perceive what God's actions, God's promises may be asking of you. Maybe it is an opening up your heart to new relationships as to who God is, because God is a God of relationships, one from the very beginning because at the beginning of Genesis itself, we become so focused on, Abraham, on Adam and Eve disobeying that we miss that amazing experience of God walking, that unique moment, God walking in the garden at dusk just to talk with him. Take a moment with that rest. It's okay to even laugh Allow that laughter to bubble up as we are reminded in this larger narrative of faith that we belong to a God who makes promises. Where in the moments we may only see like a desert and its barrenness, or maybe we sit at the seaside, salty and sandy and lonely, God fiddles. God questions where we thought we were and promises as an oath that gives faith power to survive, maybe even prosper in demanding and debilitating circumstances. This promise of a God who is promises is it's a concrete one, one specific, one handed to the next generation one able to transform the barrenness into circumstances of possibility, well-being, and maybe even joy. So where is that laughter bubbling up? Where is God calling you in your life, maybe one more time, that you are able to sit with in that moment and open yourself up to that possibility of a God fiddling? Maybe just one more time for you too. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.
Let us now join together in offering our prayers for the church and for the world. Let us pray. Creator God, as we look at the world you have made, we notice that the songs of love that you wanted us to sing have turned into cries of abuse, oppression, and prejudice. We have abused the planet that you have provided for us to inhabit and to share with other creatures. We have wasted the water, abused other resources, limited access to food, and marked borders of inhospitality. Lord, we pray for this world in need of restoration and ask that you provide us with the tools and the intelligence needed to rebuild the world you created for us. God, save us, heal us, and make us whole. There is oppression in the world that we live in. We see it in the ways human beings treat one another, taking advantage of those considered to be of less value. We turn our eyes away when we see the needy being trampled or the poor being stashed out of sight. May your will be the last word and the church an effective witness to the sovereign Lord in our midst. God, save us, heal us, and make us whole. We see prejudice in our relationships, Lord. We judge one another, not with justice and fairness, but with fear and misinformation. It's easier to demonize than to take time to listen and to establish relationships. It's easier to assume than to ask questions and to acquire knowledge. Lord, we pray that you make us agents of peace and restore our songs of love for you and for one another. God, save us, heal us, and make us whole. Merciful God, we lift up all those in our community of faith who are traveling this summer, those on vacations, those visiting family. We pray for our youth and leaders growing in their faith at Montreat this week. We pray for traveling mercies and your steadfast hand to guard and protect them all. We lift up those in our midst who are sick, who struggle with pain, those who await test results and news from doctors. We pray for your mercy your presence, and your peace. Lord, we ask that you guide us in this coming week to be your instruments, sharing your life-giving love with all we encounter. Empower us to be your people and follow you and your word without reservation. For so many blessings and for answered prayers, we give you thanks through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, it's just this simple. All that we have is a gift from God. So in gratitude for all that God has done for us, let us now present our gifts back to God. So whether it's online or in the plates being passed here in the sanctuary, let us return to God a portion of what we have been blessed with.
I hope as you leave this place and go back out into the world, may you be assured that the, lo God, the Lord's steadfast love and faithfulness will indeed meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other and go in peace, confident in the promises of God's are moments indeed that may start with laughter. May the grace of Christ attend to you the love of God surround you and the Holy Spirit keep you this day and forevermore. Amen. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same trying to fill the same old holes inside there's a better life there's a better life if you've got pain he's a pain to
this 